Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Bull Breakdowns here on the Guilty as Charged podcast YouTube channel. I am Alex, as always, to talk about now week two, uh, pretty much being wrapped up of training camp prior to the Chargers scrimmage against the Rams on Sunday. They are off uh, today, which is when this video will be uploading because the team, I think, as Harbaugh put it, will be at the Hall of Fame ceremony, uh, I believe, for Patrick Willis, and then they'll be flying back uh, for the scrimmage against the Rams. Uh, it, I don't know if it has been officially announced as a scrimmage. It has been said as joint practice, but then the Rams called it a scrimmage. So we'll see what happens on Sunday one way or another. But I have a lot of storylines to talk about from week two of training camp, but just kind of some impressions of camp in general to this point, uh, both from my being there slash, you know, what we've heard read, seen, uh, you know, online and from the beat reporters of the team and in these pressers. So let's get into it without any further ado. Uh, the big storyline of the week is obviously Justin Herbert's injury. He will be in a boot for two weeks minimum with an injury to his plantar fascia. Important to distinguish with the plantar fascia here that we don't really know what Justin Herbert's injury is. Uh, given the fact that he's in a boot, it is probable that we are looking at a tear of the plantar fascia as opposed to plantar fasciitis. But because the Chargers aren't giving us those details, I am not, you know, in a position to assume anything so i honestly you know don't know uh what exactly this injury is uh without you know the team giving us more details so uh, all we know is that he will be in a boot for two weeks uh, and then we'll uh, have this gradual return to play protocol that the team has talked about in order to uh, be ready for that raiders game in the season opener on the 8th now, we do have five weeks. Um, I think in terms of pressing, you know, DEFCON 10 on this situation, we are certainly not there yet. We're at DEFCON five and a half, six. Uh, I certainly think there are some, you know, kind of worrying things about this injury, just in terms of the fact that plantar fascia injuries in general are pretty easy to re-aggravate. Um, you know, Chase Daniel actually did a great video uh, for... The athletic in which he sort of talked about in very human terms what herbert's dealing with right the fact that you know once he does return to play and a lot of this pain inflammation uh the tear and everything kind of does go down for him that there will still be this aspect where he's planning on that foot he's throwing on that foot he's backing up on that foot right uh in order to be able to throw and that is kind of the tricky part uh, that me and Tyler talked about uh, in our podcast or our copecast uh, we did on the Herbert injury about managing all of this is there's not really one way or, you know, a, another to go about it other than just being as careful as possible. This is obviously, you know, a ligament that connects the front of the foot to the heel. So, you know, there is... Uh, a lot going on there. And obviously, as with any ligament, um, it, it, it's something that's just very easy to continuously flare up if the team and Herbert are not careful. Uh, Schefter also, I wanted to mention, had this clip in which he talked about uh, the uh, Justin Herbert injury and mentioned, uh, you know, uh, hesitance on his part. Now, who knows if this is Schefter sources saying this to him uh, in regards to kind of throwing cold water on the idea that Herbert would be ready by week one. But he said um, that Herbert may be ready by week one. That may be the expectation. But the nagging pain of this injury essentially is something that is going to follow Herbert uh, throughout this season. That was a quote from Schefter via NFL Live yesterday. You know, again, how much is that a Schefter imparting his own opinion? Is that, you know, kind of from his sources and, you know, what people are telling him about this? Um, maybe a mix of both. We don't know. But I thought it was a little bit of an interesting thing, you know, to say right after the Chargers kind of dropped the report, especially because the Chargers, you know, have openly said we're going to try to tell the media and everybody as little as possible or as little as we need to regarding these injuries. So again, the Herbert thing, very much just something to kind of 
monitor here. Um, there have been a couple other minor injuries at training camp. Ladd McConkey obviously went off limping today. Um, Kamani Vidal the other day also had a limping issue. And then there, you know, I don't want to go so much into like everybody that came on and came off of the practice field because the Chargers have pretty clearly been using that as just like, you know, sort of testing the waters for players and like being as cautious as possible, right? Where, you know, Khalil Mack and other pe people like that have exited practice, but then came back at the end because they either went to the weight room or they went to get something checked, but it wasn't, you know, really an injury. Um, but we also kind of in this stage don't know what's an injury or not unless they tell us. Um, Conkey, per, you know, the beat reporters there and Daniel Popper went off with a limp. You know, what does that mean, uh, you know, kind of for him in the short term, immediate term? We'll see, uh, you know, as far as his availability in the preseason game and stuff like that. We'll find that out next week. He could be back in practice on Sunday. We don't know, right? Again, they are, you know, they're just going to say working through something if the guy is not practicing. So uh, he did practice today and then left the practice field. So that was the McConkie situation. Pipkins also walked off with trainers. We'll see if that's something to watch. Again, as far as kind of those more minor injuries, I don't know what you want to grasp from that necessarily as far as, um, you know, long-term implications for the team or to freak out about that for the team. I certainly think this Herbert injury is scarier than, you know, an injury that, you know, they don't feel the need to tell us. Um, you know, the, the enemy, I think you kind of know in this situation, in plantar fascia injury is a little worse than, these kind of minor, you know, scrap ups. So uh, we'll see how all of this progresses. Again, I do not think it is a max concern situation, but because this is the QB one, this is the quarterback of the franchise. Um, you know, I think there are rightful questions about a, you know, how does this process where he returned to play, well, where he will return to play, takes place, right? Does he end up, you know, is he good? Uh, to play on the eighth, does he end up re-aggravating something? All storylines to follow once he can return to play. And then this is something that I talked about with Tyler um, when this in injury was in initially announced. But um, they were running a lot of you know Greg Roman type of you know schemes. Um, I think I saw a power run in in, in those clips uh, that you know came from that. Uh, Wednesday practice, I guess, in which Herbert was taking off and carrying with the ball. Some of them design looks to run, some of them evading pressure. Um, but, you know, as far as is this a concern for the run game, right? A lot of the issues as to why Herbert could not use his legs in the past, you know, were either having broken fingers, broken rib cartilage, uh, you know, some of the injuries he's had in the past that really prevented him from being unleashed as a runner. And so you kind of wonder where this plantar fascia injury leaves him uh, in a Greg Roman offense where Greg Roman, you know, has not necessarily publicly said he's going to use Herbert as Lamar Jackson or Colin Kaepernick or something like that in his offense. But certainly I think there was a, a plan or a tendency to want to use Herbert's legs, but uh, I'll leave the Herbert stuff at that until we know more information. Uh, Quentin Johnston. So Quinta Johnson's kind of had a weird camp uh, where I don't think it has been all bad for him, at least when I was watching practice in person last week. I do think you see Quinta nail some of the route running tendencies and characteristics, certainly more often than he was uh, at this time training camp last year or even in live games towards the end of last season where he really struggled particularly man-to-man, -man, press coverage situations, you know, a lot of, you know, the flaws of kind of the route running uh, and how he handled physicality are known at this point. There's no need to, you know, dive back into them. But, you know, uh, the issue for Quinton Johnston in this camp, as it was on Friday when I was there, as it was again on Monday uh, when me, Steven, and Tyler were there and has been an issue throughout, you know, the camp in which Johnston's produced a number of drops at this point um, has been that over the shoulder catching motion. Uh, and that's given him 
uh, you know, some problems in the past. Obviously, many people remember the Green Bay game, uh, not his only drop that is, you know, resembling that. But I thought it was interesting. This picture comes from Bolt Lounge. Uh, you know, he was, I actually met Adrian uh, and uh, Bree from Die Hard Bowl Club on Monday at practice. And this clip is from Monday at practice in which uh, after the team stopped practicing, Quinton hit the jugs machine uh, and started working on some of those over the shoulder catches. Now, it's a little weird to kind of figure out what is the right tone to discuss this because like Steven said in his uh, you know video and his you know tweets in which he's talked about Johnson, like I do think there has been improvement for the guy, which is not a popular thing to say right now in terms of he doesn't look quite as lost as a route runner. I do think he legitimately feels a little bit more confident in this offense. But obviously, you got to catch the ball, right? Uh, particularly, it really feels like he struggles with those deep ball focus drops when he has the defender beat and then, you know, just has to finish the play. And that part of it, you know, getting the ball down from Herbert or the other quarterbacks on this roster um, – has been an issue for him. So I, you know, really hope that he is able to figure this out. And, you know, the team feels it as well, right? In the one on Monday where he dropped it with Fulton in coverage, uh, you know, DJ Chark came up to him. I mean, we saw this from the stands, even to some degree, Steven saw a more intimate version of it being on the field media credential, but we see DJ Chark come up over to him we see Justin Herbert drop his head because, you know, he knows how Quinton Johnston feels, right, about this. And Quinton Johnston, obviously, you know, to some extent is treating every ball like it honestly, you know, is a big deal for him. And you can tell that he cares, which is why it's, you know, sort of a bummer that he's not um, catching more of these, uh, you know, what should be gimmies, right? Uh, and so I think he feels it. The team feels it. Team is trying to actively console him as we've seen you know the coaches and players uh come up to quinton but um yeah i i do think this issue despite how much quinton johnston i think uh, as i you know gave the you know a, a little bit of a precursor to my statement about the drops i do think he looks better but the coaching staff is going to go with josh palmer dj chark and Lad McConkey, particularly in those three receiver, you know, four receiver formations over QJ, if these drops aren't figured out. And that I think is the concern for Johnson heading into the season. I don't, I think there's no way they would cut him uh, or, or really move into that conversation. I think uh, until probably next year, they're simply too depleted right now, receiver to really consider other courses of action and Johnson is by no means, you know, locker room problem. Everyone, you know, seems to love him uh, in the locker room. And so, you know, the team wants to see him get better. He wants to obviously see himself, you know, fix some of these job issues. But uh, I, I think this is a story to monitor as far as the creation of the depth chart more than the creation of the roster. But, you know, Hopefully, QJ is able to kind of, you know, improve as training hit the preseason go on at this over-the-shoulder focus drop issue. AJ Finley, um, I think, has been a storyline so far in camp. He has been the primary safety behind Derwin James and Aloe Gillen. We sort of talked about the safety competition where two of those, you know, uh, safeties in the pack were going to come out and ultimately challenge um you know, each other for those two spots, presumably behind Derwin James and Aloe Gilman. Uh, AJ Finley has gotten kind of the first shot at it and really has played pretty well. Um, he has gotten the bulk of what you would call, I guess, second team snaps in this instance after Derwin James and Aloe Gilman have played. Uh, JT Woods, I would say, right now is kind of your safety four if you want to, you know, give it that. Uh, terminology and this is also raises a question about where tony jefferson is on the roster obviously the chargers bring tony jefferson from joe ortiz's days uh in baltimore right worked as a scout for the ravens last year 
uh, and now comes out of retirement to come play for Joe Ortiz's Chargers. So I think there was a perception, certainly for me, where it's like, well, you know, he's going to make the team, right? And I, I felt that way, uh, certainly for large parts of this offseason after they had signed him post mini camp, where it's just like, well, you know, one of those four spots on the roster will be Tony. Um, but he's been pretty uh, consistent in rotating with the third team. Now, in, in fairness to Tony, he did say kind of at his press conference yesterday that there's this feeling of getting his feet back under him where, you know, he had the, um, uh, what was the injury? The list Frank injury that ended his season uh, with the Giants in 2022, takes the year off. And so part of this process has been getting back into football shape. Um, so does that mean Tony Jefferson is certainly out of safety contention? I wouldn't say so yet. Um, I think we'll kind of see how this process plays out, but certainly advantage does go to AJ Finley, I would say so far, and also JT Woods. Um, Popper actually wrote that when uh, Alohi Gilman had his child and missed practice, uh, the three safeties that were in that nine, it's nine on seven you know, uh, rotation were uh, Derwin, uh, JT Woods, and uh, AJ Finley. So, uh, you know, I don't know where this will kind of leave Tony Jefferson, but right now, AJ Finley has the lead for the third safety spot. And now we're kind of on a, you know, path to see who cracks that fourth. But I think so far they have shown JT Woods kind of the advantage for that last spot there. Uh, the new kickoff rule, I don't know why my voice cracked there. But um, the Chargers actually just wrapped up their practice as I'm recording this uh, on Friday and then sent out Ryan Ficken and Darius Davis and Cameron Dicker uh, to talk about uh, to talk about the uh, new kickoff rule and sort of, you know, what it can mean. So Ficken actually, you know, Darius Davis said that Ficken showed the team the Hall of Fame game footage from last night, uh, which demonstrates the new kickoff rule in addition to XFL games. And, you know, um, Thicken really says that he wants the group comfortable by the time the season starts. I believe this week has been their first time directly in practice working with the new kickoff rule. Because when I uh, was at practice last Friday through this Monday, they didn't do stuff with the new kickoff. Uh, but they had done um, a lot of uh, field goal. They had done a lot of punt, uh, punt work. They had done a lot of stuff like that. They had not done this new kickoff rule uh, until presumably this week. Uh, and so, you know, Ryan Ficken and the whole special teams crew are trying to adjust to it. So for those who did not see the Hall of Fame game, the kicker is essentially distant downfield. There is this uh, landing zone within the 20 yard line. Uh, and then the coverage and blockers essentially kind of meet at that point uh, to some extent. So and then you'll have the returner try to return it or, you know, take it for a touchback, whatever. Um, and so, you know, Cam Dicker actually got at the press conference himself and he said, you know, there's still a little bit of a learning process to this where you see some of the kickers that he's talked to around the league essentially advise, you know, sort of almost like popping it up and then having it down, you know, at the one yard line, right? Like that is, sort of the optimal like scenario of having it land right in the border of that landing zone so then it's unreturnable some of them want to do the line drive kick right um as well so there's different strategies that uh teams seem to be trying and i think it's going to take a while uh to see where all of this lands but nonetheless i thought a lot of it was interesting also in his press conference uh darius davis mentioned being used on deep routes um uh, and, you know, a lot of different ways that they're planning on using him in the offense this year uh, and specifically said it contrasted in a different way than he was used last year. So I thought that was pretty interesting to hear from Darius Davis in terms of his offensive usage. DJ Chark, um, he had a really good uh, week, weeks, honestly, of practice. Um, you know, when it comes to DJ Chark, I, I think this is something Steven said, but he was really the only prototypical X on this team because Quentin Johnson's not an X receiver. 
Josh Palmer could potentially be the closest thing they have to an next receiver, but even he's kind of more of your like Z slot type of guy um, more than it is your outside boundary, big wide receiver one. That is what DJ Chark is um, kind of, you know, regardless of where he's at at this stage of his career. Um, but he's been up there with McConkey in terms of catches for the team. I believe he's had two touchdowns, one, which was a hotly debated offensive pass interference last week. But uh, Chark has been up there uh, pretty consistently. And uh, Darius Davis actually in his press conference today shouted out DJ Chark as a vocal leader uh, for the team in that wide receiver room. And it makes sense, right? DJ Chark is the most veteran receiver in this room, essentially, uh, playing since 2018, 2019. Uh, you know, it's it's weird to refer to, like, DJ Chark in his, like, sixth or seventh year as the Wiley veteran <laughs> um, who is now leading this ragtag group, you know, uh, post-Keenan, post-Mike. Um, but he really seems to, I, I think, be at least the wide receiver uh, I don't know how you want to order this depth chart wise. It's a little bit different because they play different positions. Um, and, and we've talked about the McConkey and Palmer thing, but he is in that starting trio um, in 11 personnel with Josh Palmer and Vlad McConkey right now. And I don't think the path towards Quinton cracking that, um, at least at this juncture, is happening anytime soon. So DJ Chark's played well, Josh Palmer's played well. Uh, and I would say Lad uh, has Lad has been <laughs> and when he when he's been in practice. Unfortunately, heard the last couple of days uh, he has been on fire as well. Um, I don't really have any other you know big storylines to cover, but just a couple things I wanted to talk about. The starting corners are the starting corners. Um, you know, Jesse Minter had his press conference in which he talked about sort of the different the distance between Asante Christian. Uh, and Jossier Taylor versus the rest of the corners that are sort of challenging for spots. And I really think despite what people think about Jossier, I don't think Tarheep still is anywhere close to competing right now uh, for that seat, uh, for that slot corner spot. And right now I don't think anyone is truly competing with uh, Sante Samuel Jr. or Christian Fulton for uh, those outside quarterback spots, which I think is pretty notable. Uh, I've stated in the past my concerns with this cornerback room, particularly uh, a lot of corners who aren't the most physical, a lot of corners who struggle with tackling, uh, as we saw with Asante in the second half of last season, and we saw with Fulton uh, and Jaw Taylor, uh, who, you know, is that the system? Is that them? We'll kind of see, but, you know, I, I, I do worry about them in run support and, even in pass coverage a little bit uh, against, you know, some of the more top tier options in the NFL. So we'll see how that goes. But right now that is your opening day starting trio. Jared Patterson. Uh, I talked a little bit about this on last week's show, but he very clearly is the third running back behind JK Dobbins and Gus Edwards. Um, you know, uh, Vidal and Spiller to some extent have been an afterthought. A couple highlights here and there for those guys. Um, but I think it's pretty telling that they trust Jared Patterson to get those reps in practice. And I'm a little surprised by it only because he is technically the most experienced throughout the rest of the roster, but also there's no like connection between him and the rest of the coaching staff. Right. So I did think uh, him ascending to that role initially was a little bit surprising, um, but he was the first name out of Greg Roman's mouth, you know, in a press conference that was not, Gus uh, or Dobbins. And so right now, Jared Patterson, as far as when it comes to run blocking responsibilities, when it comes to special teams and any of that stuff, he is your third running back right now. Will that last? Can he hold off Kamadi Vidal and Isaiah Spiller? We'll see. Uh, but right now, uh, he's the guy. And then, uh, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about Jordan McFadden, uh, who, you know, Tyler and Steven have talked about a lot already, but. Um, you know, I, I thought it was pretty interesting that Jim Harbaugh said this week specifically that it was Joe Ortiz's idea uh, to actually kind of put uh, Jordan McFadden in this, you know, fullback slash jumbo extra tight end role that they are trying uh, to kind of get him in. He's been working on the side pretty consistently uh, with the team. 
uh, and not just the you know team in terms of working with Herbert on handoffs. He's working with coaches on the side, uh, specifically when it comes to like catch technique and stuff like this. He's motioning on the line of scrimmage. Uh, so a lot of stuff going on with him in terms of being this team's fullback. And I just think the, um, you know, sort of ceiling of what he can provide just kind of at this point supersedes what a Ben Mason can give you. Um, and I, I, I think that he has an open shot at getting that fullback spot right now. Uh, it's been pretty radio silent kind of with everybody else. I don't want to dig too deep into the Jordan McFadden hype because when you dig too deep into someone's training camp hype, it can go wrong. Uh, but I really do think, not saying he's going to end up like Pat Ricard, obviously, in Baltimore, but they have intentions uh, of, of using him, I think, in a pretty serious way in the run game, um, you know, in the in the run blocking game, in this fullback extra tight end role. And, you know, he's 6'2", he's 300. Uh, he's like what the coaching staff, you know, would essentially love to have as like this, you know, sexy toy, you know, fullback option that like you didn't even know you had uh, until this point in the season. So I'll be very curious to see how this stuff with McFadden uh, all plays out during the season, if they're going to show a little bit of it during uh, during the preseason as well. But that'll do it for me, guys. Uh, thanks to anyone who said hi to me at training camp. It was cool to meet up with people when I was in California. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I will see you guys next week. I hope to be doing a Chargers 2024 season preview soon. Uh, I don't know exactly when that will take place, but I do have a special guest in mind. So, Maybe stay tuned for that one. I will give a little bit of a tease. It's not 100% confirmed, so I don't want to totally tease it. But uh, that'll do it for me. Uh, as always, see you guys later and bolt up.